We welcome back to Personally Speaking this week, the great writer and commentator on our times and our history, the wonderful and delightful and interesting always, Bill O'Reilly. Stay with us. Welcome to Personally Speaking. I'm your host, Monsignor Jill Masanti, and television journalist and best-selling author Bill O'Reilly joins me now. Bill O'Reilly's success in broadcasting and publishing is unmatched. For 20 years, he reported and gave his opinion on current events on the O'Reilly Factor on the Fox News Channel, and his show became the most viewed cable news broadcast in America. His website, BillOReilly.com, is followed by millions around the world, and he hosts the O'Reilly Update, which is heard weekdays on more than 225 radio stations across the country. Bill has written 18 national number one best-selling nonfiction books, including the Historical Killing Series, which is the best-selling nonfiction series of all time, with over 19 million books in print. Bill's latest book, with New York Times best-selling author Martin Dugard, is called Confronting the Presidents. The subtitle is No Spin Assessments from Washington to Biden, which examines each of the 45 presidents and their impact on our country. Bill's here with us today to talk about why he wrote Confronting the Presidents, as well as how these leaders made decisions under pressure and what their lasting legacies might be. Joining me now, I'm so pleased to welcome back to Personally Speaking, our friend Bill O'Reilly. We're here with Bill O'Reilly. Delighted to welcome him back to Personally Speaking. We're talking about this new great book, Confronting the Presidents. And I'm going to say, Bill, that in my experience, uh, it's woeful how little most Americans know about this particular line of study, the American president. So I think it's a great book. And for our listeners and viewers around the world, uh, get this, because it'll enlighten you about a lot of presidents you didn't know about before and give us new perspectives on the ones we thought we knew. Speaking of which, Bill, when I grew up, uh, John Kennedy was the first president I can remember. Uh, charismatic, uh, well-spoken, well-educated good heroes uh, background in World War II. So I, I thought as a kid that to be a president, you had to be extraordinary. And then, of course, the martyr's death. After your book, I'm realizing a whole lot of our presidents were anything but heroic or special or particularly good at what they did. They just were in the right place at the right time. Uh, did that discourage you in terms of the way our presidency works? Yeah, because we are uh, a free country, uh, Monsignor, we have a changing landscape all the time yeah. Yeah. Um, and it just depends who's there to fill it so uh in 1920 for example coming off uh, eight years of woodrow wilson world war one people had enough uh of the democrats and they they wanted anybody they would have elected a chimpanzee and republicans just didn't have anybody they didn't have anybody to put up so they grabbed this guy named warren harding out of ohio who did absolutely nothing in the Senate. Nobody knew anything about him, wouldn't do any interviews, kind of like what we're going through today on the Democratic side. And he gets elected by a landslide and he comes in. He's the worst president, not of all time, but he's terrible. He's corrupt. He, he's this, he's that. So some years you got two really good qualified people like John Adams against Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. OK, and other years you just don't have. And some people would say in 24, where we are now, mm. they don't like either candidate. Right. 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 But that's what happens in a free society. Yeah, it's it's a little scary, though, I have to tell you. And in the first, well, does let's say first dozen presidents that you write about, uh, with the exception of John Adams, who you just mentioned, I'm always wondering, like, about the role of conscience or morality in any of these things like. Most of these guys, most of these early presidents and not so early presidents were slave owners. Do you sense by studying them that they had moral qualms about how they made their living? No, they didn't. Um, and I don't know why, yeah. because some people like the Adams family, John, the Adams family, mm -hmm. John Adams, John Quincy Adams, the New England contingent was very stridently anti-slavery and they based their uh, opinion on the Bible. But Washington and uh, Jefferson and Madison, 
uh, Andrew Jackson, they all have slaves. Yeah. And for yeah. some reason, they could justify, you know, having them. Yeah. And I say to people, look, we're all flawed. You know that every, every we're all sinners. Yeah. What we do in this country is we honor and we just come off Columbus Day yesterday, uh, the achievement, not necessarily the man. Yeah. I mean, Thomas Jefferson, was not a good guy. No, but what he did for every single American, what he put together was so beneficial. And to this day that you almost have to put the personal stuff aside. Mm. Yeah, it's a good thing if you can do it. You know, you, you talk about him very honestly opposing, for instance, the uh, creation of the federal bank and the uh, opposition of Alexander Hamilton. Well, let's go with the whole concept of uh, good people in that job for a moment. Uh, you mentioned in the book, and it's a good example, I think, John Quincy Adams. And Jimmy Carter would be two examples you write about who uh, were probably, not probably, were definitely more successful as human beings uh, and public figures after their presidency. Are there other people I'm forgetting who, beyond their presidency, actually made a difference for the good? There were a few, but most presidents uh, either died fairly soon after they left office or just kind of faded away like George W. Bush just yeah. kind of faded away, um, didn't really inject himself. He was exhausted. He, he, he gave his country what he had. Um, I, didn't, I hesitate to go in as a historian slash journalist and evaluate moral character, but I did it with Lyndon Johnson, who was absolutely off the chart corrupt. Oh, my God, is this guy corrupt? I didn't even know that. Yeah. And I was alive, as you were, when, when Kennedy was assassinated, Johnson came in. I knew we booted the Vietnam War, but I didn't know how rotten the guy he was until we started to get all this stuff. We went, whoa. Um, but most presidents, uh, after their term, um, weren't forces. Harry Truman had a lot to say during the Eisenhower years. And, mm -hmm. he, and Truman, whether you liked him or not, very honest. Mm -hmm. and not corrupt very very not only was he honest in what he said but in how he lived yeah. so he might be one that you look to um but most of them you know after they got out of office they were exhausted a lot of them were sick and and they didn't have uh, much impact past that you mentioned harry truman and one of the things people will find out is that uh, he also left the presidency pretty much broke and and now we have all these presidents in recent times bill who are uh, multi-millionaires by virtue of having been president. Is that from your perspective uh, to be expected? Is it, is it a good thing for the country that we now have all these guys who came in relatively modest but leave as very rich men? Well, it's capitalism, Monsignor, and <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm a capitalist, so I'm not going to criticize Barack <laughs> Obama when he goes out and makes $250,000 a speech, yeah. which is what uh, the former president gets. He gets a quarter of a million dollars to show up and give a speech and sign some books and shake some hands. Yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And then he writes a book and the publisher pays him what the going rate would be to write a book. I do that. Right. Um, and so ca as long as you're in the confines... In his great book, Confronting the Presidents, Bill also not only gives you an insight into the, the man who's president, but very often he goes into great detail about the first ladies, or Buchanan's case, the first niece. But I mention that because I just wonder, after looking at all the first ladies of, of the uh, history of our presidency, uh, the two or three, you know, you have said very clearly who the five worst presidents and the five best presidents are in your estimate. But as first ladies go, who are the people top, top of the mountain? Well, Dolly Madison uh, changed everything in Washington and made uh, the White House a glamour spot. And she was a force of nature, whereas Jemmy, that's what they called James Madison, was about as boring as a pipe stem. <laughs> he was just, uh, but Dolly just dominated. And even after the Madisons left, she was a force. So she would be there. Eleanor Roosevelt was a very strange woman, mm -hmm. but did a lot of good uh, in her vision for uh, the downtrodden in America. Nancy Reagan, uh, I think, kept her husband alive. Yeah. So if you're a Ronald Reagan fan, you got to give kudos to Nancy, although Nancy was super controlling much like Jill Biden is. Uh, but I don't think Ronald Reagan could have made it through the eight years without Nancy. Uh, Jacqueline Kennedy added a tremendous amount of grace and class to the White House. 
So there have been a number of them that have really stepped up. Um, and in recent times, Laura Bush, for example, uh, W's wife, did a lot of good work in literacy because she was a former librarian and, and used her power to uh, advance education. So you, you f I, I find that the women were pretty much better than the men <laughs> when <laughs> you're evaluating the 45 presidents. That's pretty frightening, too. Now, uh, let's talk about psychological stuff. You know, particularly, I don't know why it stuck out in my head when you write in the confronting the presidents about Franklin Pierce, and we know he's pretty much a lifelong alcoholic, and he's lost all three of his children to tragic death. And so he's clearly in the White House, and he's, he's a damaged man. Uh, did any of the studies of people like Franklin Pierce lead you to believe that we should almost have some kind of psychological test, not just the physical well-being, but the psychological well-being of the people we put in the White House? Well, sure. Back then, they didn't have any kind of standards of behavior. And uh, even Abraham Lincoln, our greatest president, uh, was subject to fits of depression, yeah. black depression. Yeah. Um, but there was no way to treat it unless you're going to give him opium or something, yeah. uh, laudanum. And you didn't want to do that. So that when you look at, and we, we are pretty candid in, in confronting the presidents about which presidents we believe were unstable. Yeah. Okay, we're really not operating yeah. uh, in a rational way, and Pierce is one of them. Yeah. Uh, and the guy who took over after Pierce Buchanan, he was just a rank coward. Yeah. Um, so what I try to do in all my books, all the killing books, and then now we're in the confronting series, is be honest with the American uh, reader who yeah. wants to know about their country, who loves their country, but you just can't mythologize these guys. Yeah. I mean, Pierce was a terrible president because he <laughs> was out of control with the booze. Yeah. And um, there were other presidents in the same situation. Andrew Jackson didn't have control of himself much of the time. Uh, he'd shoot you between the eyes if you did, if you did something yeah. he didn't like. Um, so, but as it got into modern times now, the doctors in the White House are all over this. Mm -hmm. and, and so if there's something that pops out that's not right, you get a battery of people in there. It's all quiet. You'll never hear about it. But it's much more closely monitored now than it was um, pre-World mm -hmm. War II. World War II is a changing point. Now let's talk about World War II and one of the people you lionize in there, of course, is the great FDR, Franklin Roosevelt. Did, did you worry about saying he's one of the five greatest when there's a whole school of thought out there now that uh, he knew and did practically nothing to save the Jewish people from the Holocaust? That is true, um, but you have to balance that uh, as a historian. So um, what the advocates for uh, the captured Jews wanted mm -hmm. was the Allied bombers to go in and destroy the railroads leading into Auschwitz and mm -hmm. the other camps in Poland. That was a very risky mission. It was very far mm -hmm. for the Allied bombers to get there and get back. And that was the military calculation that we can't do this with any sense of success. It's too far away. It wasn't that uh, FDR said, ah, I don't care about him. It was a military decision. But FDR is a cold guy. I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to hang around with FDR <laughs> at all. Teddy, I'll have dinner with all day long. His yeah. cousin, hey, Theodore right. Roosevelt. But FDR was a calculating, not a heavy feeling kind of person. And he was going to do what he thought was best for, you know, winning the war rather than saving individual lives. And, I, I, you know, you saw that in a lot of the campaigns. And Truman's accused of that, too, by dropping the atom bombs on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You killed, you know, hundreds of thousands of civilians. But the alternative was that you were going to knock out uh, 300,000 American troops, including my father. Yeah. who was on a ship going to Japan to invade when the atom bombs died. Uh, we dropped, I should say. Yeah, um, no, no. So history is not, it's not a neat line. No. you gotta, you got to evaluate it, okay? And uh, so I don't, I fault FDR. I think you did more, all right, to save innocent lives during World War II. But he was tunnel focused on winning that war militarily. Bill O'Reilly is our guest, and Bill, you, this is not news to you that you are sometimes politically incorrect, but when I was reading about your chapter on James Polk,
and you put him among the top five, and I'm saying, okay, he did great things with Manifest Destiny and all the rest, Mexico War and all that, but he owned slaves. Like, how do you put in the top five someone who owned slaves? Because of their performance for the country, mm. okay, which overrides, uh, you know, how do I put George Washington in, yeah. in the top five? I have to. Right. Without Washington, we wouldn't have had the political structure that led to um, freedom for a billion Americans over the years, and we freed billions of people all over the world. And we would have had none of that if not for George Washington. He had a bunch of slaves in mm. Mount Vernon. So that's the, the determination you have to make. Now, Polk's a fascinating guy. He knew he was going to die soon. One mm. termer gets in, says, hey, uh, we're going to go from Atlantic to Pacific and this me corrupt Mexican government, which it was, okay, mm -hmm. we're going to swat them aside and we're just going to go in and take it all. And he did. He did. And a lot of people objected, not me. Right. Because right. he <laughs> layered out the country, which then was able to provide freedom mm -hmm. for just millions, tens of millions of people from all over the world came in because we were that big we could accommodate them. So again, you, you have to evaluate what happens and what it leads to. We, we've had on the program over the years, Jack Valenti and Joe Califano, people like that. And when you had Lyndon Johnson on the worst list, I, I think they would be uh, apoplectic oh, about they'd be, they hate me. Yeah. And I know Califano <laughs> pretty well, but I, I, I mean, every word that you read in confronting the presence is true. Yeah. I mean, Johnson sets up a bordello, a brothel to tape fellow senators to blackmail them into doing what he wants. Yeah. Califano and uh, Valenti going to defend it? They can't. That's what happened. They can't. They can't. And, and they uh, can't. Let, let's go to the other thing I was thinking. We had the Max Boot, the guy who just wrote the book on Reagan out, and he was uh, putting in the bottom five, the worst presidents, he was putting Donald Trump. Conversely, yeah, he hates Trump. He hates Trump. But conversely, we have Bill O'Reilly, who in the bottom five puts Joe Biden. Now, um, tell us why. OK, so I don't hate anybody, Monsignor. I learned I from you. That. All right. Yeah. <laughs> you can't be a good Christian and hate anybody. I dislike a lot of people. I got a very long list, but I'll hate them. And I don't want them to get cancer. And I'm not going to take action against them unless they're hurting somebody else. Mm -hmm. Then I will. So. Joe Biden is the second worst president ever to serve because he created problems. Mm. Every other president, the bad ones, yeah. inherited the problems. Hoover with the Great Depression, um, the budding Civil War, when you had uh, Pierce and Buchanan just doing nothing to tamp it down, Fillmore totally befuddled. They inherited that situation. They didn't create it. OK, yeah. Hoover didn't create the Great Depression. Nixon didn't create, OK, the Vietnam mm -hmm. War. Didn't. So Biden gets into office. First thing he does, first thing is knock out what a policy that was working at the southern border mm -hmm. can okay, remain in Mexico. There's no reason to knock it out. Not he doesn't supply any reason that he did it. Go back to the uh, the, the, the worst for a second. Um, what do you say to a Max Boot who does that about Trump? Uh, you obviously don't agree with him. Tell us the positives and where, I know we're not lining them up by number, but where does Trump fit in? Is, it, is the jury still out or would you say a fairly good president? Well, there's two separate questions there. Uh, Mr. Boot went to Salve Regina College University in Rhode Island, where my son is a political science major. <laughs> and uh, my son, uh, you know, hit him pretty hard. Uh, because, uh, in our opinion, uh, Boot lets his personal animus toward Trump override mm. his objectivity as a historian. Could okay. be wrong. I don't know, Boot. He'll never come up against me, ever. <laughs> um, don't have much respect for him. Okay. And I was happy my son gave him some jazz. Um, Trump governed effectively, if you measure that, by prosperity in the marketplace. So real wages were up more than 7% for working people. Uh, that's a big number. And that counts COVID. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a really strong number. Under Biden, they're down 2%. So it's a nine swing to the negative. Under yeah. Biden, uh, real wages have dropped because inflation is so high. 
Um, so that's number one. Number two, Trump governed like nobody else ever governed by making deal after deal after deal after deal. And most of the deals benefited us. For example, he kept Putin pretty much contained. Putin didn't right. invade any place right. when Trump was president because they had some kind of deal. He smacked Iran with all kinds of economic sanctions, limiting the amount of money the Iranians were able to give Hezbollah, Hamas and other terrorists. As soon as Biden came in, lifted the sanctions, the Iranians got three hundred uh, billion dollars out of frozen bank accounts mm -hmm. and started doling out the money to the terrorists. So when you compare what Trump did for four years without a motion, by the way, yeah. OK, to what Biden did, there's no comparison on, a, on the planet. Mm -hmm. However, Trump did not handle January 6th well. Yeah. And I don't care what anybody says. That's right, a historical right. fact. Yeah. He didn't handle it well. No. All right. Period. Uh, so that right. goes on his uh, resume. Right. And so he says dopey things. You know, I've known him 35 years. Yeah. I should put out a book, Dopey Things Donald Trump Has Said to Me. <laughs> All right. Like, like every other book, book of yours, it will go to number one immediately. You know, too. Right, it'll be a big book. But, but I say dopey things, too. You don't. But, I, you know, everybody <laughs> says... Everybody uh, says dopey. You're very kind. I'm going to let you go soon, but I got to ask you this. Um, I, you know, you have your own program, and and you're widely known and followed by people who are, are big fans of yours. A bunch of them got in touch with me recently, Bill. Uh, that we're not talking about confronting the presidents now, but they said that you had had some really insightful points to make about what the church should be doing in terms of the politics of our country and the world. Uh, because I didn't get to hear you. What did you say, Bill? Well, the Catholic Church used to be a force in uh, the United States. It is no longer. Yeah. And that hurts me. Yeah. Because if you look at the theology, and I've obviously done that, of the Roman Catholic Church, the theology holds up. I wrote the book Killing Jesus, and you read mm -hmm. it. Um, and it's not a religious book. It's just basically how the th theology evolved. Theology is fine. But the men who run the church, all right, not all of them, probably not the majority of them, mm. are afraid. Uh, they were corrupt. I think they've cleaned up a lot of that now, but they were. And they lost all credibility for people who aren't Catholic. Mm. And even those who are, the surveys say maybe 25 to 28 percent go to weekly mass. Yeah. The rest don't bother. Disturbing. Yeah. Now, what did the country lose by that? It lost a voice for loving your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. You want to be as simple as that. Yep. So the Catholic Church was once saying, look, it's not about you. It's about everyone around you. All right. Then it's about you. Now we live in a country where me, 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 me. That's it. You're way down the list. Mm -hmm. That has hurt the noble mm -hmm. intentions of the United States, because overwhelmingly we have gone secular. Mm -hmm. um, our uh, Democratic presidential nominee wants abortion anytime, anytime for any for reason. any reason. Yeah. yeah. Do and you know there are only three non-communist countries in the world that allow that? Did you know that? I did. And it's 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 a only three. It's humiliating. So why us. would why would 95 percent of nations say no, that you can't yeah. destroy an unborn child 10 minutes before that child is to be birthed? Yeah. Because it's barbaric. Yeah. Yet we have a presidential nominee who's saying, no, it's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. You, reproductive rights, you have the right. To do it. Now, 30 years ago, there would have been a tsunami of moral mm. indignation against Kamala Harris. She could have never said that. Right. Now she can. Because and that's tied in not only with the decline of the American Catholic Church, but the decline of Christianity yeah. in all religions. And that's a shame. Bill, we had, uh, you know him well, our county executive, Bruce Blakeman, into our church before the elections. 
And he said that he'd been invited to every Black Baptist church, every Jewish synagogue, but that ours was the only Catholic church he'd been invited to. I, clearly, we have a real reticence to do any kind of connection with the politicians. What are we afraid of? Uh, you're afraid of getting slapped by the uh, powers that be. Mm -hmm. These parish priests don't want any controversy. They don't want to be put in a negative connotation, called the Rockville Center to explain themselves. They just don't want it. I mean, you know, yeah. that's yeah. just the way it is. And, uh, I'd yeah. last, I think, maybe 12 minutes if I uh, were a parish <laughs> priest. I'd I'm going to let Uganda Bill O'Reilly go. Bill, last time we, we were on, last thing I asked you is the same question I want to ask you. I said to you, okay, you have done it all. You've had every success in the world. What's left? And you said, uh, yeah, I have two main concerns left before I go home to God. I want to make sure my daughter and my son are doing well and they succeed in life. Um, and now since that last book came out and with this new book confronting the presidents, give us an update. How well are those two kids doing? They're doing very well. Thank you for asking. Um, I have a different style of parenting than most people do. Uh, I believe it's my job to protect my children. Mm. Um, and so I do. And I'm not intrusive. They're allowed to pick their own uh, way. But when they go into an area where I feel is um, destructive for them and others, I let them know. And um, it's not a lot of angst here. Yeah. Uh, they have good lives. My daughter says she's a Nepo kid. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what that means. But she recently graduated St. John's Law, and I hope she uses her degree to help people. I've clearly told her that. She's a Fordham grad, and I paid for it to the tune of about 75 k a year. I said, look, you better do something good with this, okay? And my son's going to be president of the United States someday. Uh, he's uh, graduating from Salve Regina. We hope he'll go to grad school and work on the hill and run for office he he wants to be a public servant so i'm very pleased with my children i want to thank bill o'reilly for being with us again our personally speaking confronting the presidents is the latest book again right at the top of the list in terms of popularity in america we love bill's writing because he gives us not just insight but also insight that we are not always familiar with and as i mentioned to you there was tons of stuff about these presidents that i never knew and i actually studied presidents bill has opened up our minds to thinking anew about our American presence. I thank him for doing that and for all his writing and for all his upfront points of view, which I find refreshing no matter what anybody thinks. Bill, thank you once again for being with us. Thanks for having me, Monsignor. Stay well. Thanks for being with us on Personally Speaking. If you need to reach me for any reason, you can do that at personallyspeakingpodcast at gmail.com. I'm delighted to serve as host and executive producer, Personally Speaking. Our producer is Lisa Jandavitz. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be with you again next time on Personally Speaking.